In this video, we're going to examine corruption issues in the water and sanitation sector in South Asia. We're going to discuss the findings reported in a paper entitled Corruption in Public Service Delivery Experience from South Asia's Water and Sanitation Sector by Jennifer Davis, who is a professor of civil and environmental engineering at Stanford University in the United States. I have to confess that this is one of my favorite papers about this sector. I think it represents an extraordinary piece of fieldwork. This fieldwork was done in India and Pakistan about 12 years ago. I think it's helpful to think of a chain of five types of corruption in the water and sanitation sector. At the bottom of the chain, customers make illegal payments to low-level water utility personnel. On the next step up the chain, low-level water utility personnel make payments to people higher up in the organization. On the third rung of the chain, managers and agency heads solicit payments from people outside the organization. Then, on the fourth rung are the linkages between the organization and illegal activities of private contractors and consultants. The fifth link is between the private contractors and consultants and international donors. Professor Davis's paper examines the first four links in detail. The first question she asks is, what kinds of illegal payments could customers or households make to low-level water utility personnel? And she finds that there are four main ones. First, payment for a connection to the water distribution system. Second, payment to falsify a water bill. Third, payment to make a repair. And fourth, payment to ignore it, an illegal connection. At the time she did her field work, Professor Davis found that 41% of customers said that they'd made payments for falsified meter readings in the last six months. A typical payment was about 45 U.S. cents. 31% of the water and sanitation staff who were interviewed felt that payments from customers to employees for faster service, quote, benefit the customer and the employee without harming anyone else. She also found that few water and sanitation managers consider considered it a serious offense for their employees to tolerate illegal service connections. Professor Davis's second question was, what could low-level water utility personnel pay people higher in the organization to do? Again, she finds four types of payment made by low-level employees in the organization. First, payment to obtain a job or to keep a job. Second, payment for a promotion. Third, payment for a transfer to a new post. And fourth, payment to have someone transferred out of a post that you want. She found that most South Asia public service bureaucracies have a policy of transferring their per professional staff every two to three years. This policy of regular transfers has created a thriving market for desirable posts and has allowed elected officials to become de facto personnel managers in public service institutions. She found that a cash market for desirable posts exists in many locations and that the prices for different kinds of posts were well established. For example, one of her respondents described the market for job transfers. Quote, if I want your position, I can get help from someone to have you transferred out. At the time of his interview, this employee was working to amass the U.S. $1,300 he would need to negotiate a desirable transfer the following year. He asked, where do I get the money? Where would you get it if you were in my position? This clearly demonstrates the nature of the corruption chain. One form of corruption begets another. Professor Davis's third question was, what could managers and agency heads ask people outside the organization for? She found that managers and agency heads receive payments for awarding contracts to firms and various types of kickbacks. Examples of common kickbacks were allowing contractors to use substandard materials and accepting falsified invoices. A few contractors admitted making payments to politicians for assistance in winning contracts. The value of these payments ranged between 1% to 6% of the contract value. Contractors recouped these payments through the use of substandard materials and over-invoicing. Professor Davis's fourth question was, what kinds of illegal activities could private contractors or consultants engage in? And she found four main activities. First, payment for the award of contracts. Second, contract collusion. 
Here, contractors would decide ex ante how they would bid on a series of government contracts and agree not to bid against each other. Third, payments to government officials to monitor or manipulate a bidding process. And fourth, the use of substandard materials. Professor Davis found that on large contracts, it was common for contractors to partner with elected officials and senior bureaucrats. The few contractors who were willing to provide such information estimated that the values of winning bids were roughly 15% higher than they would have been in a competitive environment. The value of kickbacks paid by contractors to water and sanitation agency staff was between 6 to 11% of contract value. Professor Davis estimated that such payments were made in over half of the contracts issued. One contractor produced a laminated card upon which he'd written the payment schedule for kickbacks. Professor Davis quotes him as saying, It is too hard to remember all the rules. I don't want to make a mistake. Looking at this entire chain of corruption, Professor Davis says that these water institutions probably spend 20 to 35 percent more on construction contracts than the value of the services rendered. This estimate is consistent with my own informal assessments of the magnitude of the effects of corruption in the sector in several places where I've worked. Professor Davis also correctly points out that this cost markup is not the only important consequence. Agency staff become diverted from their primary responsibilities. Also, agency finances are undermined by hundreds of thousands of illegally connected households. Professor Davis ends her paper on an optimistic note. She describes some hopeful trends in the dynamic baseline that she feels may reduce corruption in the future. And she provides a checklist of things that water policy reformers may want to try in order to reduce corruption, such as one, an expedited application process for a new water connection, two, a reconfiguration of office space to make it more open and deter corruption deals, three, public posting of prices and connection fees, four, a toll free customer hotline to report corruption, and five, a Citizen's Bill of Rights. To wrap up, you should not be surprised to find systematic corruption activities in the status quo conditions in the water and sanitation sector in South Asia or elsewhere. In my experience, when corruption levels reach a third of contract costs or above, water agency staff spend very little time and energy on professional water work. One takeaway message from this week's material is if you plan to work in this sector, you need to think hard about how you will engage with entrenched systems of corruption and what your personal strategy to address it will need to be. Good luck.